Now, what happened? What's going on? Well, the best way I know of explaining this is to say that most species come onto this biosphere with a limited ecological range. They have the capacity to extract the resources they need to survive and reproduce, and maybe slightly more. And that capacity will give them the intellectual or genetic capital they need to survive for maybe several hundred thousand years. We are different because our ecological repertoire keeps expanding. And one way of seeing this is just through this, for me, very powerful graph of human population growth over 100,000 years. What's deceptive here is that in the Paleolithic, the long trend is a trend of growth. And I'll show some of the reasons for the moment, but it's just very hard to see on this graph. And then in the agrarian era, the last 10,000 years, the speed picks up. And then you see this terrifying spike in the last few hundred years. So this is what makes us different. We keep expanding our ecological repertoire. I'm using the phrase ecological creativity. The word te technology is being used in other contexts in this conference. How old is this gift for ecological creativity? It may be tempting for this graph to think it's very recent, but I think not. I think it begins with the origins of our species. And let me give some reasons for thinking this. Here's a wonderful site called Blombos Cave in South Africa. Humans lived here 90,000 years ago. I say, homo, I mean homo sapiens, people like you and me, biologically. And they made sharp stone spear tools using methods that appeared in Eurasia only 50,000 years later. They used shellfish. That was a new technology. Early, the earliest humans apparently didn't. They scored bits of ochre with lines that really look like a sort of proto-writing. They almost certainly used ochre to color themselves or to color objects. Um, one of the best ways of seeing our creativity in the Paleolithic era is by looking at this map of human migrations in the Paleolithic. Um, each migration represents new ways of extracting energy. So the chimp range doesn't change. That's normal animal behavior. Humans emerge in East Africa, then they start spreading in Africa, then some of them from about 60,000 years ago start, leave Africa, migrate elsewhere. These early migrations are not terribly exciting because they find familiar environments. Then they start some really exciting migrations. The first one to Australia is very unusual. No other mammal made that migration. They need to cross water. They need to be able to use entirely new resources when they get to the other end. Here's another astonishing migration into Ice Age Siberia. It, just imagine yourself dropped into Ice Age Siberia. Um, what would you need to survive? You need this, a lot of skills that we don't have. So this is high tech that's going on here. And the same for the other migrations into the Africas, then the more recent migrations into the Pacific, and eventually into the Arctic world. So the Paleolithic history of our species is a history of technological innovation. That's often forgotten. It's also our technologies were powerful enough to have a significant impact on environments. We changed flora in countries like Australia. The eucalypt is a product of 40,000 years of burning the land. But we also changed fauna. Here are the silhouettes of 60 species of Australian megafauna. Kangaroos, two thirds of the height of this room. Wombats the size of hippopotami, 60 species, seem to have vanished at about the time humans appeared. So our ecological creativity is very old. It goes back to the origins of our species, and I'd like to argue it is a defining feature of our species. It's why we have history and chimps don't. We can't imagine a university department of chimp history. Why not? This is why. Okay. What's the source of this creativity? Now it gets tough. There are a lot of scholarship in different fields I think is converging on an answer, and I'm going to describe it very quickly, as best as I can. What happened, I think, with the appearance of our species is that we crossed a threshold in linguistic efficiency. Have in mind the difference between standalone and networked computers, and this may help. And it may help also to begin by thinking about the limits of primate communication. There's an American primatologist, Shirley Strum, who studied baboons in South Africa. And one particular troop was very good at hunting. 
So baboons have culture, different troops have different behaviors. So they can exchange information. But she noticed that this particular group hunted best when a particular baboon was with them. This baboon was very good at hunting. And then she also noticed that when the baboon died, that information died with the baboon. So here we have a system of communication that is powerful, but it cannot reach the threshold beyond which information securely lodges in the collective memory because exchanges of information are too inefficient. We crossed that threshold. It's a very simple crossing, but the consequences are profound. The first species, it seems to me, in four billion years in which communication between individuals was so powerful that information began to accumulate from generation to generation, and it got locked in. So we could build. Accumulation could become, uh, could, could turn into history. So that cultural information accumulates generation by generation as it can accumulate with networked computers. How was this threshold crossed? The truth is, we don't know. It may have been a genetic switch of some kind. Chomsky has bought into this argument. It may have been a sort of feedback cycle between cultural change and genetic change. We're really not sure. But what, what I think we can be sure about is that it was crossed. And it's interesting to note that a similar crossing had occurred earlier in the history of the planet. When life first appeared, it took the form, if there are any uh, any biologists who deal with this here, please forgive me for this crude description, but it took the form of sort of bags of complex chemicals that could do some of the things of life. They could take in energy, they could split in two and sort of reproduce. What they couldn't do is reproduce accurately. In other words, they couldn't send genetic information precisely down the generations. So genetic information could not accumulate. Then along comes DNA. With DNA, you get a method of communicating genetic information so precise, so powerful, that good innovations, helpful innovations get locked in. And then you get the history of life. Then you get natural selection. So it's as if modern human language is the cultural equivalent of what happened in the genetic world with the appearance of DNA. I call this capacity for sharing information. Incidentally, if you doubt that, how powerful is the sharing? Look inside your own head. Ask yourself the question, how much of the stuff in my head would be there if I had never had human language and I had never talked with another human being? And the answer, I think, is very, very little. And that'll give you some sense of the world chimps live in. I call this collective learning. It's a new adaptive ability. It's the source of what makes us different, and it is, I believe, the source of human history. But it's also a dangerous gift, as we've seen. Um, and it may drive us to undermine the biospheric bases of our life. We adapt at warp speed. The biosphere keeps adapting at genetic speed, and it cannot keep up. And that's the great danger. But collective learning is also, I believe, our get out of jail card. Seven billion people thinking together, collectively, is a very, very powerful intellectual tool. If we can get out of this mess, if any species can, it's surely us. But if we do, we'll have to use collective learning, I believe, in new ways, not to gouge more energy and more resources from the biosphere, because the biosphere is creaking under the strain of our demands. We'll have to use collective learning to grow in ways that do not put more, more material pressure on the environment. And relevant to that idea is a wonderful graph that impresses me very much. Most psychologists, I think, study misery. There's, a, there's been a small underworld of psychologists who study happiness. And my understanding is that this is a tradition that's gone on for some time, and certain conclusions are pretty robust, and this is one of them. That happiness rises with material well-being and consumption to a certain level, but that level is quite low. Beyond that level, there seems to be no correlation between increasing consumption and a sense of well-being. Some very rich people are happy, some are miserable, and vice versa. If that's true, it means building a better future does not depend on increasing consumption of resources and energy. And I see that as a difficult but hopeful conclusion. So I want to leave you with a conclusion. 
And the conclusion is what I think emerges is the challenge, if these arguments are correct. Can we, first, use our remarkable capacity for collective learning to, secondly, drastically reduce our ecological footprint, while third, maintaining the well-being, contentment, and sense of fulfillment of most people on Earth? Thank you very much.